Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this, uh, I can say, very special day. The day we are honoring Anton Kato. So, why honoring Anton Kato? What was the idea? Why organize such a day? Well, the idea actually started as early as 2014. Like so many people in the Netherlands and Belgium, and also here of my generation, they started with the book of Bruno Ernst. Bruno Ernst, Timus Sterbok. So in the Netherlands and in Belgium, it's the most knowing book to beginning in astronomy. And in this book was, was described how do you make a cutter? Telescope. Now, what I didn't know was the writer of this book, the author of this book, Hans de Reek, his real name, was a good friend of Anton Kutter. And later on this day, you will see him on film. Next slide, please. So, Anton Kutter, we are now uh, June 16. There is also a reason why I would organize this on this day. It's very clear. He was born on June 13, 1993. So this weekend was nearby his birthday. That's one of the reasons. Next slide, please. So, cut of telescopes. <laughs> Good time you're laughing. <laughs> you know who that is? <laughs> no? Uh, it's, uh, Canada. it's a guy in Canada. It's a guy in Canada, Ruben so, uh, he's uh, of the Netherlands. He's a good friend of Hans Decker too. Uh, and he's working with uh, 30 centimeter sheep spiegel. Uh, the weight of that thing is more than 600 kilo. So he needs his tractor. <laughs> <laughs> to take that thing to work, to work on that. Next slide, please. <laughs> So, how do I came? Uh, it's a film. Yeah. I'm going to tell you uh, if you look at sound, you look at sound. Um, in 2016, I organized in the old monastery of Bruno Ernst. So he was a priest in that time. <coughs> and he made many cutter telescopes. So I say I organized a cutter day into the observatory. Like you see, they were uh, full. Then it was full, full of people, there were 40 or 45 uh, men. So the one, the one here at the front, the man, is the good one. So I uh, sent it to him and he said, Yes, I have contact with him. And then, oh, 10 uh, years ago. So, that's at the end, that is still alive. <laughs> yes. So, Google is your friend. I Google the name, children of Anton Kutter, Pimera Hatteris. But nothing more than that. And let's come out. Good morning, dear friends from all over the world. I welcome you also in the name of our mayor, Norbert Zeidler. It is always a great pleasure having conferences with international guests here in our city of Biberach. From the Middle Ages on, Biberach was a trading place with international relationships. Fastium, a material woven from the Biberachian flax and imported cotton, became popular throughout Europe until the business was... But we will start with the one <laughs> who we ended yesterday. <laughs> so we started with uh, Adrian. So I'm always also very glad that we have here an international public. We have Solon of Austria. We have Barry Adcock of Australia. We have Mrs. Yarto nearby Denmark. It's almost in the back, so we have uh, everything. Adrian, it's a thing. Thank you. 
it's better to take that. Yeah, I think that it's special. Thank you. Yeah. That's why I use this. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. I'm very proud that you are here to honor my father and to my English is not so uh, the best. Um, uh, my lecture I've uh, written in uh, German, and thanks my wife Helga Reicher, the actress, is standing behind with my uh, children. <laughs> my children Jonathan and Stella, and thanks uh, for help. Uh, she has translated uh, the text in English. And so it's perfect. <laughs> I hope I, I can give it uh, with my words in a, in a perfect English. No? So years ago, um, the 13th of June 1903, here in Viva. And this, this is his birth house. Um, and uh, half of the house belongs to the family just uh, till this day. Um, yes. Uh, this one of the, home, the oldest uh, city houses of Viva. Uh, 655 years old, 655 years old, completely uh, yeah, done. Good. Um, 1912, the first cinema called Lichtspielhaus from my grandfather, Gottlob Friedrich Erb, um, was opened. A beloved place of cinematographic wonders and dreams. Uh, for the evidence of Biber and especially for the youth, you can think. A place which was also very appealing for Anton Kutter, particularly because of the and full length movies, dies February 1st at age 81. To a generation of telescope making enthusiasts, around the world, this German amateur will be especially remembered for pioneering a form of reflecting telescope with tilted mirrors. In such an instrument, incoming light suffers no obstruction on the way to the focus, yielding exquisite images of the moon and planets at high powers. Kutter's interest in tilted optics stemmed from a friendship in the 1930s with Philipp Faut, a famous German astronom, who was compiling an atlas of the moon entirely from his own meticulous drawings with a 15-inch Schuppmann telescope. A Schuppmann contains tilted lens and mirror elements, the objective being a large, simple lens. But Kutter revived the earlier concept of the all-reflecting Brachyt telescope, invented in Vienna about 1876 in a, in a film Kino Museum in, in, in Biebrach. No? The next one. That's in uh, München Pullach in the, in the 1930s uh, uh, with his uh, uh, first built Schiefspiegler in the garden uh, of his friend uh, Professor Anton Staus. The next one. Uh, in his uh, uh, house in Munich, uh, his father working at his desk and then uh, in the background another Schiefspiegler, as you can see. That is in the observatory in München Pullach, uh, that he, uh, where he worked together with his friend Anton Staus with uh, a Schiefspiegler, as you can see. And another Schiefspiegler also in the 40s, I think, in München. And now the observatory is in Biberach in 1956. My father in the observatory on the top of the cinema. And here the 30 centimeter Schiefspiegler in full length in the observatory. Now you can see it here and in 
in uh, some days again uh, in uh, Ghent at uh, the Observatory of the University of Ghent. Thanks, uh, my friends, uh, Jean-Pierre and Guy. Uh, uh, they have restored the um, trace, uh, 30 centimeter and there it will be presented. Uh, and if you can make uh, a visit to Ghent, you can see it there after us. Okay, thank you very much. Faculty uh, Astronomy and Physics. My colleague, he wants his work at the university, so it's his job. For me, it's just a pleasure. We brought a visit at Alien Götter and we promised him the telescope and the observatories. At the Ghent University, the Department of Physics and Astronomy. I'm the engineer in charge of uh, the observatories of the Ghent University and that's uh, four domes in total uh, we have. It's two for public observations and two for uh, university work. Uh, two are on our campus uh, Stelle and two are in the city of Ghent. The, uh, that's the old observatory, it's date back from 1912 and the telescope that we have there is dates back to 1880. So we have a history in old telescope and restoring them. And so John Pierre came up with this idea. He has the ideas and I do the engineering logistics. That's how we work together. So we went to Biberac last year, March, to collect uh, the telescope. Uh, we came with uh, three guys. Uh, one of our technical staff came along to help us. And the first thing that we did with the telescope when we got back is uh, a bit shaky. Uh, we reassembled the telescope in its original state in our workshop. So the, you see the technical group we have, we have uh, three retired engineers uh, and myself uh, reassembling the telescope. It was in a good shape, the wood was all good, the, there was not too much rust on the mount, it was all dust and, and old grease and all stuff. But uh, the first thing was just reassemble thing, make sure. Maybe if you had a look at the telescope which is out there, uh, something might be a bit funny for uh, those who are familiar with telescopes. It's the way that the telescope is mounted on top of this equatorial mount. So it's a German equatorial mount, but it does not have a counterweight shaft. There is the standard one. Normally this is the declination shaft, and the telescope would be on one side of the declination, shaft, uh, the declination axis, and the other side would have a shaft with counterweights. Now, Mr. Kudak, I don't know where he got the idea, but is that... And when I was 10 years old, I got my first telescope. A very little one, but I joined, then I looked to the moon, and so on. With 13, I got from a friend of my father a letter from a field telescope, which was damaged, except slats. So we could make that design. And I built my first color telescope when I was 15. And then I sent me to a ball of the grinding set with glasses and powders at the <laughs> you might wonder an elderly lady talking about astrophysics techniques. No, I won't. I just give you a very short introduction in the background of possibly the biggest chief spiegler of the world. I don't know yet. Is it in the world or is it in Europe? But anyway. This is the story of my father and his chief speaker. But before I have just a question, you were talking about Steinheil elements as counterweights. Uh, when did you acquire them? Uh, 
in the 30s, uh, must be between 1936 and 1940. Okay, so there is no link, because my father was cooperating with Steinheil as well, but at another period. Stop here. So no. that's my father. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just want to quote him first in German, because one of his... Oh, most important parts were uh, cosmogony explanations of the universe. And uh, I quote him, Ich sage, der Mensch, dieses kurzlebige Wesen, müsste viel bescheidener sein bei seinen Erklärungsmodellen des Kosmos. I give it in English as well, I mean the this uh, human being with his short lifespan should be more careful about the way he explains the universe. That was always a very important thing for me because generally all theories also in natural sciences were presented as truth, as facts, as not a theories, and he always said, be careful, it's just a human theory and it can be changed. And he was on the way to have another model against Urknall, but unfortunately he died when he had just started to go into this matter more deeply in cooperation with a young man, uh, uh, physics, uh, what is it, not, not uh, I mean, uh, he was physic, physica. Uh, physicist. Physicist, yeah, okay, so that's the right word. Uh, he had just started two months to work with him and then he was gone. And at the beginning, beyond that, and in the beginning, when he was not really allowed to work in uh, Germany in technical matters, but he was, he was quite lucky because he was working in a field that was not that much required by the regime. It was not rockets, but just radiation. Radiation, every kind of radiation he was working in, and he could do it far away in now a Polish Zopot. And he was left more or less quiet there and uh, could work and could even, like uh, <coughs> Schindler, have a Jew in his company. He said, it's very important for my work to have it. Uh, that was the way how it worked in Germany in that uh, general <coughs> you just applied uh, to have somebody in your company which was, would otherwise gone to a Nazi camp. <coughs> he had just uh, one friend in his small, six person thing there. And uh, in these early years he didn't yet uh, work in astronomy. And then after the end of the war he came to Germany, but he wasn't allowed anymore to work in technical matters. You, you know, probably the Allied forces didn't allow scientists because they had a list, the Osenberg list, where all the scientists were on, which they wanted to have. So whoever didn't come with them was not allowed to work. So he was lucky because he was in the British zone and the British commandant, or what is it, uh, the highest one in that zone, anyway, he helped him to get, make it survive in whatever context. I'm ready for everything. Only I, when I take care of it, it will crumble into pieces. I cannot do anything else. Here you see it in the building, and uh, next, uh, that's Werner. Of course, he is one of the experts. Ronke, 
and Jean-Pierre, they are the three experts which can give you data and uh, real uh, explanations to it, if ever you have questions about it. I cannot tell you anything. I didn't even realize that it is the biggest until I got uh, the email oh, from Jean-Pierre. <gasps> what do you have there in Germany? <laughs> I was never told by the a university in Flensburg by, by nobody that it was such an important instrument. So that's my short message, my problem which I have. And if ever you have questions, we have, yes, uh, this is the next one. And uh, do we have another one? Uh, oh, here you see. Now it's gone? Yeah, now you see the, the type. And uh, the planetarium, of course, that's not that much, uh, I mean, from what I learned here, and you are, you are real specialists in astronomy, and not the planetarium is probably not that much your task. But anyway, I mean, it. It was, it worked for uh, now uh, 50 years. It's definitely in July uh, 1969, uh, just for you, Werner, for the birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, it is in Bilovec. Yeah. And it's, it has a future there, because in Luxembourg, of course, People are so used to uh, digital, digital uh, presentations uh, and not, I mean, the summer guests in this summer uh, resort are not that much interested in sincere astronomy. Is there a further one? No. No, okay. So that is my very uh, short a message about my burden, a treasure, which is a burden. I regret it, but as I said, I need help for it. So, if thank you, thank questions. you so much. President Holland, Bruno Ernst. His real name is Hans de Rijk. He was a priest at that time, in the 60s. But he was also a good friend of Anton. And he told me, Anton was my friend, but that kind of telescope, I hated. I hated because that was an ugly thing. So that, had, that thing had two mirrors. The long stick goes there, the other one goes another, so you do that. But he told me, I made him, he was my friend, so I helped him a little bit. And the telescope, Jesus, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so the first night I came in the observatory, I was talking with Adrian, and after a few minutes, Florian, his sister came to the observatory. Your Belzi? Yes, I'm Belzi. Oh, in the 60s there was a friend of my father, Brother Erik. Brother Erik, yes, Bruno Ernst, Bruno Ernst is Hans Rijk, Hans Rijk is Van Elshoop, whatever. The man had seven names. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's awesome. It's like that. And Florian told me he was a friend of my father. And I tried to look them up in 68 or 69, I've forgotten. And I was at the monastery, but he was away. And I never found him again. I wonder what happened with that man. I showed her that. <laughs> I will give you his number. So it's a 
really small world. So after 50 years, the two of them are again in contact. <laughs> Ik ben Hans de Rijk en ik heb Anton Koeter ongeveer 60 jaar geleden leren kennen. En... Hier? Dat is Klaus. Dat is Klaus. Dat is mijn zuster. Dat is niet jouw zuster? Oké, okay. zo so vergeet het. Zo dat is Anton, dat is Fabian. Dank je voor de gesprek. Dank je. Das ja. war, äh, nein. Du hast Erkenntnis gefeiert und... Ja, ja, nee, ich gucke gerade, wo ist denn... Äh, irgendwo ist doch was zum Text. Äh, da ist das äh, Bild. Kennst du die Bilder? Ja, die kennst du. Ja, 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 ja. ja, ja. Mhm. Und, Schau mal, ist drin. Ja. Ich schätze nicht. Das war hier. Also da. Thank you very much. As a matter of interest, when I left my hotel room, Australia and France were one of the... Let's start with the um, beginning. I'm a member of a few things, but the main one is the member of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, where I was president on several occasions, and I was director of the Lunar and Planetary Section for 40 years. That shows a map of the world and that shows where we are at the moment. After being isolated down there for quite some time, I feel very honoured to be here and I'd like to thank you all for the privilege of being able to come. In Australia, the state of Victoria is down the bottom there, and that's a, a bigger map of Victoria. Um, Melbourne is the capital of Victoria, it's there, and it has a population of 4.9 million people. I just live, well, virtually in Melbourne, but just perhaps a little bit further north. That's a picture of our home. Um, it's hard to see the house because it's covered with trees, but it's just an ordinary house in behind there. Um, it, uh, Melbourne is divided into suburbs or small areas, and um, that's my address. Can you believe that? <laughs> that's the coordinates of, um, of where I live. I guess it all started for me with that issue of Sky and Telescope magazine. I had a brother who was very much older than me, 12 years older. He had a car and I was still only eight years old. Um, he used to drive me around and he used to bring home copies of Sky and Telescope from the library. And that particular issue was one of them. And I probably read that when I was perhaps 12 or 13 years old. And I can only remember being quite fascinated with the whole thing, not being able to fully understand it. But um, it, it all seemed uh, pretty incredible. I guess the next step was um, about 1967 when I read about the Schiesbegler in that um, uh, compilation of um, telescope articles in, from Sky and Telescope and it was that article by um, Oscar Knapp uh, showing that diagram of, the, uh, of his own version of the Schiesbegler which was uh, I think a 4 into 100 millimetre version that's a picture of the telescope, and that, uh, stepping on from there, I actually ordered Glenning's Bulletin A from Sky and Telescope, and as a result, that was what, what appeared a, a year or so later. That's, a, uh, that's just a standard, I think it's a hundred year, um, just a little bit bigger than a hundred millimeter um, anastigmatic sheath spiegel. Um, for the purpose of photography. That's the same setup for a conventional camera using eyepiece projection. <coughs> I 
I said to someone before that um, a homemade telescope reflects the character of the maker. Um, that's the sector for the main telescope, and it also is a, a wooden uh, gear. And what it reflects about me is that I had no money. What I had done with the telescope in making the um, construction of it was that it was, was actually bigger than it needed to be. And without doing very much alteration at all, I converted it into a 360 millimetre cutter, Jake Spiegler, uh, just by making a couple of new mirrors and putting them in the same, uh, same uh, telescope mounting. And that's a picture there of the of the finished 360mm Schiesbegler. One thing that is, I've missed out on uh, photographing, and I'll point it out now, is that the secondary is mounted on three points through the secondary cell. It had a, a 70mm finder, and there's a, a similar one, again, not visible on the other side. Well, that's, that's another view of the telescope. Uh, that's the finder. Um, that shows the... Uh, just to look them on, on the screen. That's the uh, design of the support system for the, second, for the primary mirror. And that's a picture of the inside of the cell. That's what I was looking for there. Um, um, lens, and that's a picture of the new cell for the second mirror. And in fact, the mirror is actually in the in the cell in that picture. That's a picture of the primary mirror sitting on my main polishing machine. But um, incidentally, I made all of the, the first one, the 315 mm piece, by hand. Every, all the polishing and grinding was done without any machine at all. But um, the arms that uh, push the pitch lap across are not, not mounted on the machine in that case, that's just it's sitting on the turntable. I can polish the secondary mirror on my other polishing machine, and that's, uh, that's not it actually, that's another thing altogether, but that's, uh, that's, that's the way we make the secondary. This time I was able to turn to photography to keep a record of the um, figuring of it. And again, these are not finished articles, but that's the that's the that's Brochy test of the primary mirror. That's the secondary mirror tested on its test plate, and that's the tilted lens tested um, or putting in front of the um, the test plate for the secondary. But overall, if we go to a picture of the um, optical layout again, I have a 500mm optical flat, and I tested the, the whole telescope in auto-collimation right at the end, and that there is a picture of the, the final test. That's a double pass through the telescope to, um, to test the final figure. That hole in the middle is in the test plane, is in the optical flat, of course, it's not enough not in the telescope. I'm always bemused by that mark there. I think it must, I've never noticed it at the time, but it must be a, a hair or something that was in the, in the, in the past that, um, that it was a nuisance now. There are a couple of other telescopes that I have. Oh, that just shows the um, a, a scale of drawing of the, um, of the whole thing. Um, where I laid out the battles for, for um, protecting against scattered light. There is another battle there, which is a horseshoe shaped battle. That's not clear there, but um, it's like a, like a half battle that um, is useful for the uh, operation. In all in 19, what was in the 2008, I took those pictures of Jupiter through the 360mm chest burglar. They're digital photographs and junk.
the other picture I was going to show you also is that I have a almost 10 inch at 245 millimeter F10 triplet, and that's a picture of it then. And um, it also has a six inch refractor as a guide scope. Another view of it there um, that's got the digital camera attached to it. And the work that I do with the Schiefsbergler and with this is to take mainly infrared pictures of Jupiter. And um, that there is uh, a picture on the, um, that shows the time, March the 6th this year. That's a coloured picture of Jupiter on that night. Then these pictures here are taken with... Uh, uh, ever since I came across the Big Chief Spiegler uh, for the first time in my life in 1986, I was very curious about this design and tried to find every piece of information uh, to form a coherent image of this uh, type of telescope and I uh, would like to show you what I found. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, as you, I want to start with a look back into the history. Uh, as many of you maybe know, uh, Anton Kote found uh, the first solution of the Schiefspiegel in 1938. That was a two-mirror system. And he worked feverishly on many, many design variants until it never was completed. So, see, so uh, Kutte helped other amateurs build their observatories, their telescopes. He gave advice, but no more real design progress since the late 1950s. And then in June 13, 1967, Anton Kutte's 64th birthday, the telephone rang. And Dieter Lichtenknecker, a famous astrophysician, was on the other end of the line and presented him a new task. He had a customer, which Kutte didn't know the, the identity, and he wanted a system of 600 millimeters aperture to be used from the visual range to about 20 micron in the infrared. It should be comparatively fast at f15. And it had a very difficult form that worked well at about f20 for, for smaller apertures, but never at 600 millimeter aperture at f15. So this idea would not work. Then he had another idea. Please, the next slide. You can do, uh, you can perform another uh, form of correction by tilting the mirror so that uh, coma is uh, removed and correct the residual strong uh, astigmatism by elastically deforming the secondary by pressing it into a cylindrical form. And this is a, a special mirror cell built and tested by Mr. Kutan where he tried out uh, this kind of deformation already quite early, must have been before 1953. And he said the correction was very good, but it was not stable. He thought, why should I not replace the correcting lens of the cathodioptric Schiefspiegel with a curved mirror? to uh, perform the, the ultimate correction. And he had that, tried that kind of uh, correction also uh, already in the, in the beginning of the 1950s, but the calculations turned out to be very complex and he was not successful and turned that approach down. He gave up. It was too complicated. But now he thought uh, here such a solution is needed and he uh, started his calculations again on paper with log tables and after about eight days he could inform Mr. Lichtenknecker that he had found a solution and that he wanted to try it out. Now I will go into a little detail uh, here. Uh, this is a scale drawing by Mr. Kutter himself 
and you see that the instrument, this new all reflective three sheep spiegler because of the three mirrors, is much shorter than the catadioptric two mirror solution. This he uh, reached by making the primary faster and increasing the tilt angle of the secondary. The third mirror had a very, very long radius of cur curvature. This is a departure from the way he did his designs for many, many years because, and this is the first known photograph of a three sheep spiegler in the whole world, uh, where he tried out some aspects of the instrument. Is a, it is only a temporary arrangement. And uh, in the course of the of the uh, <coughs> request by Mr. Lichtenknecker, it was stated that the light from the tertiary mirror to the focus, focal point must be exactly perpendicular, right angle, to the incoming light. And this is not yet achieved in this model. There's a, a still a, a difference of eight degrees, so he had to work on it. And um, in the autumn of uh, 1967, uh, Mr. Kulte underwent uh, surgery, and he took his optical files and his log tables with him to the hospital to help him recover from the operation. I mean, how, how fanatic must one be to take math uh, files with him uh, to get uh, to, uh, to, to recover from the, from the stress of an operation earlier and better. I, I couldn't do that. Uh, next slide, please. So and this is a scale drawing of the finished. And these are some photographs taken when the huge instrument was unloaded from a truck and it started in the observatory. Uh, it's easily visible that it was quite an, quite an achievement. And uh, when soon after the telescope was installed, uh, put a, uh, got a letter from Mr. Menke and only then realized who the customer was. He did not know for, him, for whom he was doing the design work. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, Kutte did not publish his work on the Trischiefspiegler in German. There was no article in Stern und Weltraum or in some other form, uh, but in 1975, almost eight years after the inception of this design, he finally managed to publish a two-part article in Sky Telescope, the leading astronomy journal in the United States. And shortly after these articles, a company called Cal Astro uh, produced an optic set of uh, 4.25, 6 and 8 inches of aperture so that uh, amateurs who were not inclined to grind their own mirrors could buy optic set and concentrate on the mechanical design. And it is estimated that about a dozen three sheep spiegler were made in the United States. And until 1988, there were no more rumors or reports about this kind of telescope. Until 1988, Telescope Optics, the book uh, of Harry Rutten and Martin van der Wederboy came out. A spot diagram from the book uh, Telescope Optics and it shows the performance of a catadioptric sheep spiegel of 200 millimeters aperture. This is the image center. You can see a very small residual aberrations. Small compared to the airy disc, which is this size. Red and blue are almost perfectly corrected, so this is about the image quality you can get from a typical half or yearly apochromatic refractor. And then the next slide, please. But what's this? 
This is the spot diagram of a 200 millimeter equal aperture three sheep spiegel, but there is no point or near, nearly a point at the image center. There's a huge flaw. The area disk is smaller because of the greater speed, which uh, translates into a smaller area disk. And here we have the situation that this kind of image quality is hardly usable. But, please the next slide. The actual users of the instruments tell otherwise. Here are three quotes. The instrument's contrasts and definition are finer than with any other telescope of 110 millimeters of aperture I have built, says Oscar Nahm, who made the first Trichy-Spiegel in the United States. For a 110 millimeter aperture, seeing such detail, that is, craterlets on the Keys and Milichius stone on the moon, speaks for itself. And these details, the very tiny uh, openings in volcanoes on the moon, they're really hard to see. And finally, Anton Kutte himself, the small three sheep spiegel turned out to be, I'm inclined to say, the culmination of my second vocation. So three people who were very happy. So how can this be? Question mark. And this uh, riddle was unsolved until two years later, uh, another US amateur, David Stevick, had a great idea. Please the next slide. Mr. David Stevick, who is a, uh, was an uh, amateur, amateur uh, astronomer in West Virginia, had written in his spare time uh, a ray tracing program for the personal computer and had uh, run simulations of the three Schiefspiegel and came up with the same not satisfying spot diagrams as Harry Carton and Martin had also came up with. But he had an idea. Please, the next slide. Now, what's this? This is the same telescope, but the spot diagrams look much cleaner, much tighter now. And all Mr. Stavik had done was to increase the distance between the secondary and the third mirror by 22 millimeters. There was, for reasons that are still unknown, an error in the prescription in the original article in Sky and Telescope, so the published design was not the optimum design. Uh, next slide, please. But now, uh, a fully satisfying image quality was restored, and the good uh, image sharpness and image contrast could be explained. And in the documents available to me, uh, Kutter himself uh, mentioned that he did distanzänderung, that means uh, small changes in the, in the uh, distances between the mirrors to bring the system to full correction. And this is also characteristic for Schiefspiegel telescopes. You can, even if the specifications are off a little bit, you can restore perfect image quality with the mirrors uh, that are available, uh, provided that you leave enough uh, space to, to uh, move the mirrors around a bit. That causes a higher order aberration called trefoil in the, in the jargon of the optical designers. In German, it's Dreiblattfehler, and that error can't be corrected easily. So, uh, with the uh, formula available for Mr. Kuta and his limited accuracy with the log tables, I think that he did not even notice or know that such an aberration was in existence. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the development, however, did not stop. Uh, this is the original Trichy Spiegel, 
and then word spread about it in the United States, but nothing was yet published. And uh, an uh, amateur from Oklahoma, Mr. O'Neill, asked a, an optical designer in the United States, Mr. Bartröder, if he could design a three sheet spiegel similar to the Kutte design for him. And Kutte had, uh, Bartröder had maybe seen some of the Kutte specifications. The situation is not entirely clear here, but he used the large computer at the Optical Sciences Center in Arizona to uh, design something along those lines. And he used an equal radius uh, set of mirrors for the secondary and the primary. That was something Kutte had done in the 1940s already and Bartröder knew about, because it was published in the return way. And then uh, also chose the third mirror to be per exactly perpendicular to, to the incoming rays of light, which is a bit not the optimal solution, as we shall see later. Uh, using the uh, mirrors of equal curvature uh, as the same, of the same type as in the early kind of sheaf spiegel resulted in the typical F20 design, which is much, which is a full photographic stop slower than Kutte's solution. And as you can see, the system is much larger, much longer. And the next slide will show us a comparison of the image quality. This is a 200 millimeter version of the optimized Kutta. The, uh, the circle of confusion already approaches the, the airy disk. And the Bartröder has a larger airy disk because of its, it's a slower system. But you can see that the, that the uh, central spot is certainly a depth curvature than in, in Kutta design and it's also uh, smaller in diameter so, so that this, this trefoil error cannot uh, uh, extend uh, to such a uh, huge extent. For people who wanted to make their own instruments, these mirrors presented an obstacle because they were so very long in, 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 in curvature. This is about 32 meters of radius of curvature, and this is about 40 meters. So it's nearly impossible to test. You would have uh, to make a, a mirror of this size and, and test it um, in the, in, at the distance of an, of an Olympic uh, uh, pool uh, and, and need a telescope to view the, the surface. So it's, it's Many amateur astronomers did not uh, have much interest in, in trying such a such a, a device. And again, uh, in 1991, Mr. Stevick, as he explored these designs, uh, asked himself, uh, "What if I make the third mirror of the same radius of curvature as the secondary?" And that he did and tried out. And the result we will see in the next slide. He departed, his point of departure was this system, and he changed it until it looked like this. Here we have equal curvature. The image is now inaccessible between the, the light rays, but something magic happened if you look at the image quality of this system. This is the next slide. Where are the spots? If you have keen eyes, you can see them. Here. All actual and, and field aberrations have completely vanished. They're gone. They don't exist. Uh, for optical designers, it's a nice case study. But uh, as David Stavik uh, himself told me, it took him three weeks until he could believe that this was not an artifact or a computer error, but it was actually true. It, 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 all aberrations are gone. 
The next slide, please. But again, what to do? It's a great image, but you can't see it because you would have to stuck your head into the telescope. <laughs> and so we did the same as uh, Isaac Fiore did. We used a plain fourth mirror at this point to make it accessible. And please notice this is an F12 system. This is the fastest we have ever seen, and it's also the best one. The next slide, please. And this is the Stavik Paul telescope. Uh, the Paul name is from a French optical designer who discovered a similar system in 1938, but it was not unobscured like this one. So you require a paraboloid as a primary mirror, then two relatively easy to make auxiliary mirrors, and a plane mirror that can be scavenged from every Newtonian telescope, it's not a big one, you can buy it for a few hours at, at every telescope maker supply store, it's a simple diagonal mirror. And end up with an uh, excellent telescope. But, it still has disadvantages. It's very long. If you, uh, can you go one slide back? Maybe you remember uh, the Barkröder reflector was quite uh, longer than the Kutte uh, design. And the Stavik design is even longer than the Barkröder design. So above maybe six or eight inches of aperture, perpendicular to the optical axis, as in every camera uh, lens, uh, it is tilted by depends on between 5 and 10, sometimes even more degrees. And if you take that tilt into account in the software, these nice points explode to rather gigantic, gigantic blobs. And this is not a special case for the Stavik Hall telescope or for the Kutter Schiefspieler. All forms of three Schiefspielers have this problem. And it can be a problem if you want to take photographs with a large sensor. You have to tilt the sensor, or your eyes have to accommodate uh, for the focal plane tilt, which is easy for young people, but for old ones like me, uh, it become, tends to become a problem. So what can be done about this? One solution is on the next slide. This is Adrian Kutner holding the tilted camera, uh, the tilted plate holder for Mr. Kutter's large uh, Schiefspiegler, which he used to take the moon photographs. And you can see there is a tilt included. It was even adjustable. It's about six degrees, as I measured from the, from the photograph. That is needed to keep the image not only sharp, not only in the center, but also in the periphery of the negative. But there is also another solution. The next slide, please. Make that plain mirror, which Stan can introduce, concave, make it hollow, and then uh, the focal plane tilt can be eliminated completely. Uh, next slide, please. And this was done by the German amateur Michael Brun in about 1989. He attended a whole family of instruments that also include a concave, as indicated by the blue color, a fourth mirror. And these systems can be made quite fast. This is a design for 12.6, F12.6. Uh, it's quite compact. You can you have place to install baffles, and you have uh, a lot of free cone to install a large focuser and every auxiliary equipment you might wish. Uh, next, last slide. And this is a spot diagram of the uh, system we saw before. You see that the image center is very well corrected. There's only a tiny trace of uh, trefoil error and uh, 
an area of the size of the full moon as depicted by these spot diagrams is uh, rendered in excellent sharpness and there is no image plane tilt. This is the uh, spot diagram for the untilted case and you can uh, see that it's almost a dream, uh, a dream came true because with these four mirror systems all relevant aberrations can be if not completely corrected, at least kept under very well control. And this is not a, just a special case. Many, many variants around these lines are possible. You can make them faster, you can make them slower, you can make them a little less compact with even better image quality. Thank you for your attention. And you'll, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. Please. I have a question. Uh, the chief speaker, uh, behind. Yes. It's not in 1967. Uh, is this the first? Of the... the one that's uh, behind, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Anton Kuter uh, was, uh, because of his workload, only uh, able to uh, make that optical setup, that test setup, into a completed telescope until uh, two years later, in late 1969. And he was very, very pleased with the performance of that of that system, yes. It's the very same. Use myself. I'm a test engineer and assistant engineer in the optic branch. I work for Hensoldt in Oberkoppen. And I work especially at the moment on a sheaf spiegler, a professional sheaf spiegler laser beam expander telescope for a laser communication terminal, which is later on uh, integrated in satellites as a space based. And yes, application of Shi Spiegler Heritage and Computer's basic ideas. Next slide. Um, I want brief outline, brief discussion of Anton Kuder's early Shi Spiegler and benefits of 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 Shi Spiegler's uh, we have for modern systems. Second, I will present a list, a selection of, of, of chief speakers which emphasize his benefits. And finally, I will present uh, this uh, industrial chief speaker design I work for. Uh, maybe if we are in time hurry, I can just short a little bit the first section, uh, because I think you are all very any abstractions. And he wants to have only spherical mirrors because they are the easiest to manufacture and test it, to test optical surface shapes. Next slide. On the left side is the aperture. As you, uh, in the left hand, and so images are less blurred, maybe still dancing, but less blurred than the ones you get with larger apertures. Okay, next slide. Um, you know, Anton Kutter uses spherical mirrors coming along with uh, spherical operation errors, which means no common focal plane for rays from the center of the mirror and from the rim of the mirror, as you can see in the sketch on the left side. So, he's designed as a possible drawback with respect to geometrical operations, which uh, blur your images additionally. And for visual systems, you know it all. When you observe objects with your naked eyes, there exists the rule to suppress geometrical aberrations below a quarter of wavelengths. And then you, know, you tell, or you can say, the system is dominated by the unavoidable diffraction blur. And in high, in high performance optics, as, as I deal with, you try always to suppress geometrical errors close to zero. Okay, and then the methods to correct geometrical operations, you know, all, uh, say, there are four methods to suppress it. The first one and the one cutter use is use a high F number, means a high ratio between focal length and aperture. The disadvantage is, of course, uh, it means large long systems, 
and image brightness goes down with the F number squared. You all are familiar, familiar with that. The second method is to use aspheric elements, for instance, the parabolic uh, mirror, which had lay in 1721 towards the first. Third method is to use more elements. You have more degrees of freedom, as we saw in this Spiegler already mentioned. And the last is, of course, correctors like Anton Keller did. This is red straight lens, or also famous as the glasses for the Hubble Space Telescope uh, is the Costa experiment. Okay, next one. Now, I'll list, uh, before I list my modern Schiefspiegler design, I will summarize the benefits of Schiefspiegler. The combination of an unobstructed aperture together with an all reflector. I was personally involved in the design of testing of the grating wheel yeah. and uh, the filter wheel. And the off axis, the mirror astigmat, the four optic and the imaging optic was designed by uh, Astrium, uh, now Airbus uh, Defense in Space. Okay. Uh, now, an example for a um, mili military reconnaissance chief speaker. First. At first, uh, I want to say some words about uh, where I'm from. Yes. Um, I come from a very small observatory in Uning, a small town at the Lake of Constance. It was founded 60 years ago by Revision Gunnar uh, After his retreat to his, his, to, to his old age of 68 years, in 1993, the public guided tours through the sky have been continued by a non-profit association specifically founded for this purpose. Actually, we have a total number of 18 members, with 10 members active with the maintenance of the equipment and with the members active uh, operating the public tours. So, and now came to the old projects. Shoot it. Who was the point? Dieter Lichtenhecker, well known. And uh, the builder of the telescope was uh, by me and my brother Thomas, and supported by from colleagues Hans Ludwig Reichmann and Johannes Hildebrand. In former times, this telescope has been used in the observatory of Laubheim. You can here see uh, another picture from this instrument. In the summer of uh, 2015, this instrument, no longer used for several years, was in a quite sad condition. And by luck, it was found by Johannes from me. He sent me these pictures uh, by mobile phone. On the 1st of November, in this year, after some discussions and negotiations, Yeah. yeah. Negotiation. We drove to Laufheim to continue with the front part of the structure and the tube for the secondary mirror. The drive units for both axes are integrated in the structure and the telescope is movable in both axes without any mechanical problems. Thank God. The available accessories could be mounted using specifically realized adapters. You can see here. That's 
the old possessor here. Made by Lichten Decker. Then we decide to enlarge it and all it in the United States uh, new eyepieces in a new diagonal from uh, Harry Seward. And here you can see uh, the correction lens and his, his supporting systems. Okay, this complete. Connection between the front and the back part of the tube for the secondary mirror uh, because it has to be transportable. So, the design of this telescope has still some possibilities for optimizations. So we design, uh, decide to uh, change the whole design. As you can see, we build a new structure. So. Ready. And in May last year, we are ready for first light. We had, we had a new finding scope. Uh, and in October last year, the least test could be found. Some pictures. They said the moon. Yeah. A view through the eyepiece. You can see here. Taken with a mobile phone. It's possible. And in November the 4th last year, we at the observatory of Überlingen had our big day. The Skispiegler was moved to its new destination, Überlingen. Um, it was built in Karlsruhe at my brother's home. Not at my home. That was the problem. <laughs> so, a car completely filled with only telescopes <laughs> and one driver. <laughs> so, you can see the whole instruments, and for comparison, the old tube. So, thank you for your attention. Yes, one question. Do you know the difference in weight between the old design and the new one? I know the weight of the old. I know the weight of the old tube. It was 32 kilograms. Only the tube without any optics, without any, uh, without any eyepiece and so on. And the whole instrument without mount at the moment has 27 kilograms. Mm -hmm. oh, really light weight. What did it take one more time? Restructing the mount or restructing the tube? Uh, both was nearly the same. Okay. Because one part was my brother and the other part was my part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, no more questions? Uh, when is the next day for a public show? For Having a look through that so in the evening? This evening, this Maybe evening. Maybe this evening in Alpine. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so let's stay in Alpine or we'll go to the building. We will be kidding in Alpine. That's a dream. <laughs> I only have once, not twice. <laughs> But yes, it's an amazing telescope. <laughs> that we can all say. So we have the version of Anton Kutter. Yeah. We have your version. It's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Since the centimeter. We have seen the telescopes of your father. The 36 centimeter of Mr. Hanko. But that here is the smallest. Well, you know it. It's the smallest telescope. Yeah. At this moment, there is just one. This one. 
And this one, we like to give it to you and your family. Oh. <laughs> it's your... Uh, <laughs>